This is Twit. Apple's WWDC Worldwide Developers Conference is underway this week. And on Monday at the keynotes, uh, Apple announced the new Apple Vision Pro headset. Uh, it is a mixed reality headset that um, by all accounts is uh, sort of a, a masterpiece of hardware at the very least. Uh, and some folks were able to try it out. Uh, one of those folks is MacBreak Weekly's own Jason Snell of SixColors.com, uh, who was able to give the device a spin and will be joining us today to talk about the experience he had with the headset. Hello, Jason. Hi, Micah. It's good to be here. Yeah, good to have you here and good to talk about this. Um, one of the unique things that I think you and any member of the press who's gotten a chance to try this headset gets to talk about is the setup process before the setup process uh, with this headset. It's my understanding that there may even be sort of like a multi-room process. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit. I mean, uh, walk us through it as if we have a headset on and we're looking through your eyes as you're going through uh, what it takes to get from uh, walking into wherever this is taking place to actually sitting down and trying it on. Sure. So it's a it's a rainy uh, morning in C Cupertino, uh, setting the scene. There's a guy with a squeegee trying to wipe all the water off of the temporary building that they put on the soccer field at Apple Park. Um, too much detail. So basically, what they need to do is they need to have an eye adjustment because they actually have these magnetic uh, magnetic clipped uh, uh, image adjusters that go in so that you don't have to wear glasses in there because there's not really room for that. Um, I actually have a pair of something similar for the MetaQuest 2. Um, you know, you get your prescription and then in, in the long run, Zeiss Optics will fulfill it because it's technically a medical device because it's it's actually like corrective lenses. Um, so those will be, if you need lenses, that'll be an extra purchase on top of the already expensive purchase that you'll be making. Um, I would say that then, um, so they do that. And then also they enrolled me with basically something that if you've ever done face ID, you know, you hold the phone in front of your face and you kind of uh -huh. do the thing Move where you around. circle your face around. Um, that's what they do. Uh, my understanding is that you'll be able to do that. If you're ordering online to buy one of these, you'll actually do that yourself in the Apple store app. And that it will be otherwise if you go into an apple store they will have an app there that will do that for you and that is to get the contours of your face in order to find the right light shield which is basically the piece that goes behind the hardware itself and it blocks out the light from the rest of the world but also it's doing padding and cushioning to get it to be the right shape for your face so that the that the weight is distributed top and bottom um, and Apple, oh. Apple said very specifically they don't have very many of those for this demo, but they anticipate by the time the product comes out, they will have a lot of them. So, uh, so that you'll be able to get one that fits your face uh, in the ideal way. Now, because this is a demo, basically that happens, and then we are sit, sat in something like a kind of like an airport lounge, uh, while behind the scenes, undoubtedly, they've got this limited number of functional. Uh, devices and they will, you know, snap in the light shield and put on the corrective lenses that are closest to your prescription and then put it in a room. And then you go in a room and there, you know, there's a, like a fake living room there and you sit down and say, uh, all right, let's get started. And then, and then I actually put on the device and then there's an actual setup routine, which is kind of delightful where you do some eye tracking setup by looking at a bunch of following a bunch of dots with your eyes and then you hand hold your hands up and it scans your hands for hand tracking and at that point it just drops you into um into reality essentially it drops you into a view of the room so you don't enter some sort of like magical fairy tale land when the thing boots up uh for the first time once it scans your does your eye tracking and scans your hands you are in the room that you're in and and there's nothing that makes it look any different from the actual room other than that wow. you're looking through this device so yeah, let's actually uh, two things here. First, it sounds like, and you'll have to correct me uh, if if you think I'm wrong here. This is one of the most sort of bespoke products that Apple offers. Uh, it, it perhaps <laughs> part of that that huge price tag. It sounds like when someone goes through this process, there's a certain level of customization that's taking place between the potential need for corrective lenses, but also these little uh, head shapes. Um, is it that they're going to have a range of 
you say 25 or is it that they're sort of trying to I, custom make it for every honestly, single person? I honestly don't know. I imagine there will be some range. I don't know if it's five or 20 or something in between, but I, I mm. think it's not going to be small, medium, large. I would say, yeah, it's probably the most bespoke in a way, but at the same time, they're probably using a very similar pathway that they do for Apple Watch bands, right? Because mm. Apple Watch bands mm. come in lots of different sizes. Um, now that they've got the loops, those come in very specific sizes. Uh, remember, originally it was just sort of, sort of like the individual Apple Watch band with a bunch of dots in it, and it's sort of like you adjust, you get the big one or the little one, and then you adjust. But with their with their loops that are not adjustable, suddenly they've got eight different sizes in every color right and i think it's right. going to be a little like that where they will have every apple store is going to have a stock of whatever that number is of the light shields that they do i i think it is a question like depending on how much you rely on that uh there's a lot of questions about if this is a multi-user device and it, it sounds like right now what apple is saying is it's for a primary user and then there's like a guest mode um kind of a bummer if you're in a two-person household and you both want to yeah. use it that you have to one of you has to be the guest but the other part of it is like is the other person even if there's two users on this thing is the other person going to have to buy an additional light shield and like snap it on and snap the other one off and do all of that uh to get the right fit and that so it sounds like it's going to be a pretty intensely personal device then again this is apple i think part of what they're trying to do here is is make it as you know, perfect on your face as possible. <laughs> so speaking of perfection, um, one of the early reactions I've seen and actually uh, heard yesterday at the, the talk show event was the sort of striking uh, realization that you, when you go into that mode, uh, right after you, you've done the setup process, that it looks like reality. And uh, John Gruber mentioned for him at least that he could sort of lift up the headset, put it back down, and there was no difference between what he saw. But I noticed in your um, in your writing about this that I, it, you almost didn't go that far with it. And so I am curious to hear kind of uh, in in your initial look at things how how much like real life it felt for you versus what you've experienced in the Meta Quest 2 and perhaps other headsets that you tried. I know you had experience yeah, with PSVR I, as well. I've only used the original PSVR and the Meta Quest 2 and there are better headsets available now. The Meta Quest 2's cameras are black and white and they're grainy and they're nothing like this, right? And I know that Meta's got other products now that are not like the, the Meta Quest 2's really low quality cameras. I, I would say, I think Gruber's right in the sense, he is making the point that it, you're, you're not coming to it from an unlikely perspective it doesn't feel like you're looking through a camera lens that's somewhere else it does feel like mm. you're at the exact same perspective and height and everything as where your eyes are they are trying to get that to be a perfect match what i would say is one as as john gruber mentioned um it is there may be some color balance issues i felt like the color was a little warmer he said it was warmer and i actually agree with him it felt a little warmer than reality there um and that's just i mean that's a hard thing to get right but it was close and then the other thing i would say is like it, it's not perfect it's not supposed to be perfect but the truth right. is there's like reality is very highly detailed right and these are 4k screens they're really impressive screens but the truth is they're a little softer, right? I mean, it's a camera and it's a screen and it's a little softer. I'd say it's remarkable. And I say that you can very quickly forget that you're even looking at screens and it feels like you're looking at reality. But I don't want to overhype it. It's not indistinguishable from reality because that would require a level of detail and realism that we don't we just don't have high resolution screens who can who can do that and cameras that can do that yet. Although when you look at this, you do have to keep thinking that this is a first generation product and chances are in five years, we're going to look back at it and think, wow, it's so primitive, even though it is one of the most sophisticated pieces of consumer hardware ever made. Uh, so, yeah. you know, they could, they could up it and, and it's already pretty remarkably close to reality enough that you can sort of like forget that it's not. And that's a, a pretty impressive start. I just don't want to overhype it. It's not like you, if you woke up with that on and couldn't feel it on your face, you'd think you were looking at reality. It's not quite that, detailed but uh it's real close it's pretty good yeah and let's talk about materials um it, you know i it is it makes sense that the part that seems to be the the swappable part for different sizing you know you're not packing 
too many of the most expensive materials into that part. So it's a little bit easier to make different versions of it. But what is this actually made of? What does it feel like to, to lift? Whoops, to lift? Is it heavy? Uh, and maybe how does it compare balance and on your face uh, in comparison to the other headsets that you've tried? Well, it's multiple parts. Think of the the primary tech part as a as like a big curved iPhone. Um, it weighs it weighs about a pound, a little less than a pound. The, the other stuff adds to the weight to it. So there's this part in front that is the heavy part. It is aluminum and glass, but it's attached to the face shield and it's attached to the head straps. And I think there's an interesting bit of industrial design going on there, where up front. It feels very much like an Apple product. Again, glass and aluminum, little, you know, very carefully machined holes and little little buttons on top that feel like language we've seen in other products. It's an iteration of those products. Um, but the strap that goes around your head is this woven material. It's elastic, but woven. It looks, it, it really reminded me of like a wool sweater or something like that. It's actually kind of puffy, kind of fluffy. And... Mm. I think that there is an intentional thing there where Apple is trying to balance the sleek technical aspect of the front part of the product with a or an organic, almost homey and comfy feeling, a soft feeling on the back part of it, um, which is it makes it feel a little more humane, which I think is what they're going for here. They write down to their philosophy of not wanting to cut you off from the real world. And they want it to be kind of like, it, it's like some of Apple's other materials, like, uh, like watch bands and various leather things that they do where they're, where they obviously have spent a lot of money and time thinking about the materials that they're using in something like the band. And I, I the band was really nice. It was a very well-made soft kind of pleasant thing. And, and, and so I think they're trying to isolate the parts that are touching your body uh, and make those soft and organic and feel like really nice materials. Um, and then the thing that's that's the technical product is hanging in front of your face, in front of those mm. objects. And, and so you don't shouldn't feel like you have a hard metal thing pressed against your face, right? That's that. I think that's what they're trying to avoid. And um, mine was a little off balance. I think I didn't have it adjusted quite right, or maybe I need an, a different face shield. It kind of was resting a little too far on my forehead. But um, my experience with all these VR headsets is that it takes a little time for you to figure out what the right, you know, how to put it on and how to wear it right so that you can wear it in the long run. And, you know, I, Apple expect the best materials, I would say, with a product like this. Right. And let's talk about the actual experiences that you had. I'd love, there were lots of them and a lot of people have talked about them. But for you, I'm curious to hear what you found to be the most compelling sort of demonstration of everything you were able to try or if there were a couple that really just got you. Yeah, well, 3D content, uh, I wasn't surprised that 3D content was good. Honestly, on the Oculus Quest, which is a very low resolution screen, it's the best 3D movie experience I've ever had, really, because it's different when it's going straight into your eyes and you're not wearing like weird glasses and a screen that's at half brightness, which is what happens when you go see a 3D movie in the movie theater. So being in that, uh, not just the, the Avatar clip that they showed us from Avatar 2, which is obviously very aggressively 3D, but they had a, you know, there's the home video that's in 3D. There are these immersive videos that are like 180 uh, 3D objects where you can like look down and see that you're on the edge of a cliff and feel a little bit of vertigo and stuff like that or feel like you're flying. That's all, or the sports clips, which are spectacular. And it's the same thing. It feels like you're there. Those are powerful in a way that I think you got to see it to understand it, but it's not, it doesn't feel like a gimmick to me. It feels like a different kind of medium. Um, especially the stuff that's not in a, a motion picture frame, although I think 3D movies will be great in it. Um, the other thing I would say is gestures. And I know it sounds almost boring, but like I found the gesture interface where you're using your gaze to select something. So whatever you're looking at, it, you, you just look at a thing and then do you know a tap of your fingers and you've clicked on it. There's no cursor to move. Where you're looking is the cursor, essentially. That... I picked it up so fast because it's so intuitive to realize like I look, I click, you know, you hold your click gesture and you move side to side, you're swiping. You hold that click mm. gesture and you move up and down, you're 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 um you're scrolling. And that all felt really natural. And the one that I I I keep thinking about and I I, I wish I could do again 
is there's a little indicator at the bottom of every window when you're in this shared space with apps running and windows open. And it looks like the indicator at the bottom of the iPhone. It's that little rec white rectangle. And on uh, Vision Pro, you look at it and then you and then you grab it essentially by putting your your finger and thumb together. At which point, if you if you hold on to it, you can just pick it up and move it anywhere in the space. You can move it to the right, move it to the left, push it back, pull it forward, and then you just let go, and that's where it stays. And it felt completely natural. The idea that you can just reach out essentially and grab a window and just move it where you want it to go. Um, they really nailed the interactions. I mean, you could tell that this is Apple human interaction designers working for years to try to find the right way to get this thing to feel natural and also use kind of our our tapping and swiping skills that we picked up over the last 15 years with the iPhone. I think they did a really great job. There are lots of questions I think to be had about like, who wants this? Will people buy it? Will they buy it eventually? What are the use cases? I think that's all fair, but as a pure bit of computer technology, it's just very impressive. It, it, it is remarkable um, how good it felt. And this is a, I know it's a canned kind of uh, demo. It's only the stuff that they've got working and they're six months away from release, but I couldn't, I mean, it felt like an incredibly thoughtful product that was, uh, you know, using all the parts of Apple that we kind of recognize as, as making interesting products. Uh, it's all in here. Whether people want it or not, open to question. But like I was, I, I came away super impressed with not just the hardware, but like the whole user interface and the software is very good. Nice. Well, Jason, I want to thank you so much for taking some time to join us today to talk about this. Um, it is always a pleasure to kind of get to hear people talk about their experiences with it, because I really do think that adds to it. Um, everyone should head over to sixcolors.com to check out your whole uh, review and or at least first look at this and, and kind of get into the nitty gritty details. Uh, is there a place where folks should go to follow you online or perhaps anything else you'd like to uh, promote? Uh, yeah, I would say the upgrade podcast. Oh, there we go. We got it. Uh, the upgrade podcast at relay FM, relay FM, relay .fm slash upgrade. We've got a post uh, keynote episode up now. And then next week we'll be recording and my co-host, Mike Hurley and I both used the, uh, vision pro this week. So we will have some really deep hands-on thoughts, hopefully about that next Monday. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. We appreciate it. Thanks. This episode of Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. ACI Learning provides world-class service from beginning to end of your training journey and beyond. Fortify your expertise with access to self-paced IT training videos, interactive practice labs, and certification practice tests. Individuals use the code TWIT30 for 30% off a standard or premium individual IT pro membership at go.acilearning.com slash twit. Thank you.